My parents bought their first house back in 1972. It was a fixer-upper, but they decided to move in right away and fix things as time and money permitted. Within a few days of moving in, the new neighbors came over to introduce themselves. They also let my parents know that the previous owners had moved out after a nasty divorce. They had lost their second baby from SIDS, and their relationship went downhill from there. My parents were horrified, more so because they were newly pregnant and couldn't imagine going through such a thing. They eventually pretty much forgot all about it. Life went on. They were in love with their new life and their new house. In preparation for the baby, they decided to wallpaper the nursery. My dad told my mom there was no need in wallpapering the inside of the closet, but she insisted. She was kneeling down, scraping off old paint inside of the closet when her eyes fell upon something that made her blood turn to ice. Written in crayon, at about eye level for a kindergartner, in childish scrawl was, I killed the baby. My family holds a camping trip at least twice a year. One year I was walking through the woods with my cousins, and off in the distance, on top of a huge boulder, was a very large cooler. As we were climbing up the boulder to the cooler, we spotted a man, older than us, maybe about 40 years old, leaning against another boulder, watching us. He was smoking a cigarette. He was wearing old-looking torn jean shorts. You know the kind, that used to be pants, and a wife beater. Honestly, we could tell from the sight of him that he was bad news. The creepiest part of this encounter was he was smiling at us. It felt like he was waiting for us to look inside the cooler, but when we saw him, we climbed back down. We turned around, going back the way we came. None of us said a word to him, and he just smoked his cigarette, smiled, and watched us leave. I really doubt there was sodas and beer in that cooler, if you know what I mean. My husband and I were laying in bed one night when we heard a noise. Nothing crazy, just a small rustling noise. We argued over who should go check it out, decided it was nothing, and then tried to go back to sleep. We heard the noise again. What the hell? You go. No, you go. While we were arguing, in whispers because my daughter's bedroom had an adjoining door, we heard it again near the foot of our bed. I turned on my phone to use as a light and saw my daughter on the floor. She was on all fours, cocked her head, turned her face toward the light at a most disturbing angle, and then skittered on all fours back into her room and into her bed. My husband and I were absolutely horrified. She was sleepwalking and crawling and had no recollection. She did creepy sleepwalking things after that for years, usually while we were watching scary movies or lying in bed in the dark. Kids are the worst. When I was 13, I woke up in the middle of the night after hearing something hit my window. The window in my room faced the street, and we didn't have a fence or anything in front. I looked over and saw a man standing outside my window. He was smiling. He didn't do anything except stand there and smile. I wanted to scream, but couldn't for fear of what he would do. After a couple of seconds, he walked away out of sight. A few more seconds later, I heard my front door open. No mistake, it opened quietly, and you couldn't hear it unless you were awake and listening for it. After that, silence, for about one minute. Then, my bedroom door opened, and the man walked into my room. I was petrified. He stood there right in front of me, and just smiled. His clothes were dark, and he was clean-shaven. He stood there for a good minute before turning around and walking out again. I heard my front door open and close, and then nothing. I ran to my parents' room 
and told them what just happened and they freaked out. They were positive they had locked the door. It was the scariest thing that's ever happened to me by far. I have no idea who he was and I never saw him again. One day, I was called over to babysit. I did it a lot for these people, so it was routine for me. I was told to put the kids to bed at 9, and I did. After I put them to bed, I started watching TV and doing homework, waiting for their parents to come home. But then, I started hearing some noises coming from the basement, like pans falling and stuff. I ignored it at first, and thought it was the washing machine or something. A little later, I started hearing the noises again, so I decided to call the police and tell them I was hearing noises coming from the basement at the house I was at. The lady at the station told me there's a patroller in your area and that he'll be at the house in about 20 minutes. A few seconds after I hung up the phone, the phone rang. I answered, and it was the 911 responder I had just spoken to. She sounded frantic and told me after I hung up the phone, the line was still active, and then she heard another line hang up on my end. She then told me to go into the room with the children and lock the door. I stood in the dark room with the sleeping kids clutching a kitchen knife for about 15 minutes until I heard a knock at the door. Walking from that room to the front door to let him in was the most intense experience of my life. There were two cops that came, and they didn't find anyone in the basement or anywhere else. When I was seven years old, I woke up in the middle of the night with an earache. I decided to tell my mom and stepdad and walked out of my room. Someone was sitting in the chair in the living room, about three feet away from my bedroom door. The person looked strange. The face was just kind of distorted, but it was dark and I couldn't see well. Mom? I asked. The person shook their head, and I started getting scared. Mike? The person shook their head again. I decided the best option was to go back to bed so I wouldn't have to walk past this person. I climbed in bed and closed my eyes for a second before opening them and seeing the person standing in my doorway, smiling madly and nodding furiously. I need to share this experience I had at work the other night. I worked the late night shift at the CVS pharmacy by my house. The shift starts at 9 p.m. and it ends at 2.30 in the morning. Honestly, it's the easiest job I've ever had and I really enjoyed it for the past year. But last Sunday I was pulling up the purchasing program on the computer at the front counter to add some products that we had run out of. While I was on the computer, I didn't notice the man walk right up to me. When I did look up, I almost fainted because of how close he was. And on top of that, the guy didn't say anything after I did notice him. He gave me this psychotic little grin, and I asked him if he needed help finding something. He shook his head no, and then asked me if anyone else was working right then. This was an immediate red flag and I lied and said yes, there's a manager and three others somewhere around. Then his smile grew and he said, liar, almost to where I couldn't even hear it. Then the awkward silence, he stood there like a psycho and I eventually had to just look away and tell him I needed to get back to work. I literally couldn't look at him anymore, I was shaking. He was so creepy. When I looked back up again, he was gone. I looked around the store from where I was standing but didn't see him down any of the aisles. I walked out from behind the counter and looked to see if he was crouched down in front of it. No, he was gone. I felt relieved but also terrified because I knew that he had to have walked out of the store very fast in that amount of time to just vanish like that. I was probably looking away for 10 seconds or less. I was a bit shaken up for an hour or so, but I forgot about it after a while. 
At 1.45, I started to clean up and get ready to close the store. I finalized the inventory, counted the money, and wiped down the windows and counters. When everything was done, I grabbed my drink, my keys, and my phone, and walked over to the door to shut off the lights and lock up. I flipped off the lights and leaned down to unlock the sliding lock on the bottom of the door. When I stood back up, and while turning to go out the door, my eyes scanned over what I thought was a head peering over at me from one of the aisles. I stopped and froze in place, and then slowly looked back over to where I saw it. There was nothing. I wasn't sure that I saw what I thought I did, but I was scared. Then. While I was thinking of my next move, my train of thought was shattered by the man as he crawled out of the aisle on his hands and knees. He knew I could see him, because he started hysterically laughing. I went out the door and violently dialed 911 in the parking lot. I didn't see the man come out, and I circled the block until the police arrived. The man wasn't in the store when they went inside, but they did find his clothes in the aisle he crawled out of. In seventh grade, I needed help with math, and every day after school, I met with this girl who was tutoring me. I went to the library where we normally met, but she wasn't there. I sat and waited for a good half an hour before I decided to walk down to the multi-purpose room to see if she was there. I know that she worked there sometimes, too, she would help out an after-school band class or something, and they practice on the stage there. I didn't see a single student or faculty member on the way there, which I thought was odd. When I went inside, it was silent. The band wasn't there. Right next to the entrance door, there was a door that led to the stairs that led up to the stage. I opened that door and saw a pair of feet sticking out at the top of the stairs. Someone was laying down up there, I thought. But as I walked up, I had a sudden sickening gut feeling. The feet were twisted in a way that a healthy person just laying down would not do. I climbed the stairs, and when I got to the top, I saw something that no 12-year-old should ever see. It was a body, my tutor, my 13-year-old tutor. Blood was covering her face and her shirt. Her eyes were wide open. The expression left on her dead face. I still see it. Blood was all over the floor, and I felt as if I was actually dreaming for a second. It did not feel real. I turned and went down the stairs on the verge of screaming at the top of my lungs. I finally ran into a teacher, and between hysterical sobs I told him what I found. The police covered the school 30 minutes later, and I was taken to the hospital for trauma therapy. The girl was stabbed 37 times in her chest, her stomach, and her throat. I've been forced to tell people this story my whole life. When I was five, my parents went out one evening and hired a babysitter. The woman they hired was very nice to me from what I can remember until I went to sleep. I woke up to her standing in my bedroom doorway, smiling like a crazy person. I started crying and she told me she was sorry and left the room. I fell asleep, crying. I assume it was hours later when I woke up again to her sitting in a chair at the end of my bed. I screamed as I saw her face, which she had twisted into a crazy expression. I began to cry again, and she just held the expression. I covered my head with my blankets and was shaking uncontrollably until my parents came home. I was pretty sure I heard them talking to the woman, and that's when I took my head out of the covers. The woman was still sitting in the chair, making the same disturbing expression. 
I screamed and cried, and my dad came running into my room. He was livid as you can imagine, and I heard him yelling at the woman as he kicked her out of the house. My parents have always told me she was just trying to scare me. But why? Someone of her age? Why would she do that? When I was 15, I used to babysit for this little girl named Sarah. Her parents were the kind of people who liked to go out every Friday night, so I always babysat for them. But after what happened to us, I no longer babysit for anyone. It was a typical Friday night during the summer. I showed up to Sarah's house around 6 o'clock, and her parents left me pizza money, gave me and their daughter a hug, and took off to go out. Sarah and I were playing Candyland together and scarfing down pizza when the phone rang. I picked it up. Hello? No one responded. All I could hear was the sound of someone heavily breathing on the other end of the phone. I repeated, Hello? Then, the phone hung up. Wrong number, I assumed. It was now around 9.45, and Sarah had to be in bed by 10 o'clock. I tucked her into bed and turned on her nightlight and closed her bedroom door. I went and sat on the couch and started texting my friends. Within five minutes, I heard Sarah's door open, and Sarah comes walking out holding a stuffed animal up to her mouth, and she had huge, wide eyes peeking over it. I asked why she was out of bed. She moved the animal away from her mouth just far enough to say, There's a man watching me from the backyard. I ran to her room and looked out through her window, but there wasn't anyone out there. As I was looking, the phone rang. We both jumped, and I ran back out and answered the phone and said hello. After a few deep exhales, he said, The door isn't locked. I hung up the phone and ran to the front door and locked it. Holding the phone, shaking, I tried calling Sarah's parents, but no answer. I called the cops, and they came out to investigate, but came up with nothing. The police finally got a hold of Sarah's parents, and they immediately came home. I told her parents I wouldn't be babysitting anymore, and I went home. I don't know if that guy ever called back again, or showed up again, but all I know is that I'm done babysitting. My girl and I frequent the drive-in theater all the time in the summer. I'm not sure if it's different anywhere else, but at the drive-ins closest to us, there's two movies that play on a single screen back to back. It's also pretty cheap, so it's an awesome choice for a hot summer night. We were doing our normal thing. We went to the store to get some candy and beer and stuff before heading to the drive-ins to save some money. I'm sure you know the food at the theater is ridiculously overpriced. We made it there about 30 minutes before the first feature started, and people were still showing up and positioning their vehicles. We got to the front row with nobody in front of us, which somehow I always managed to get. After 30 minutes of waiting and munching on junk food, the preview started for the first movie. Everything was completely normal up until this point, and during the previews, I heard a noise outside. It sounded like someone had kicked a rock at my truck. Not a lot. It just sounded like one good-sized rock hit my tailgate or something. We thought nothing of it because of our focus on the screen. An hour or so went by, with no other unusual sounds, and we were enjoying the movie, when suddenly we both heard something strange. It sounded like somebody was walking right next to my truck, and dragging their feet heavily. We looked around, but saw nothing. As I was looking around, I spotted a girl in the passenger seat, in the car next to us, looking at me. She had a concerned look on her face and motioned for me to roll down my window. I did, and she immediately said, There is somebody under your truck. This made me feel sick. 
I knew she wasn't messing with me and didn't know what to say back or what to do. My girl started to quietly freak out, and I asked the girl next to us as quietly as I could what the person was doing, and she said back, I don't know. I was afraid to get out, and I remembered that eerie feeling that I had when I was a kid, and I didn't want to step off my bed at night for fear of somebody underneath. Same feeling. I decided to call the drive-in's number listed online and told them what was happening. After asking the details of my truck, they said they'd send somebody over to us. Before anyone came, we very suddenly heard more noise under us, and then a girl, wearing a dress, crawled out from under my truck right in front of us and began walking backwards towards the movie screen while looking into the truck. When she got to the screen, she turned and walked away towards the fence that separated our lot from the one next to us. A few minutes later, a man approached my window, and I told him that she had walked away. Nothing else happened. It was so bizarre. I work at a government building downtown. My shift begins at 11 p.m. Throughout the night, I'm the only one here. I sit in a very small room and watch the surveillance cameras that surround the exterior of the building. I've never had to call the director for any reason or incident until this one night. I was doing what I always do, and that's relax. I watch Netflix on my phone. I'd be lying if I said I didn't fall asleep sometimes. Hell, I'd be lying if I said I didn't fall asleep most of the time. This one particular night, I fell asleep a quarter past three in the morning. I had a dream that made me wake up abruptly, like those ones where you fall off of something. I couldn't remember the dream as soon as I woke up, and I'm pretty sure my body was just trying to tell me that I needed to wake up for some reason. I reached for my coke on the desk next to the monitor and froze. On camera B5, which was the hallway leading east from the lobby, was a woman. She was walking slowly and was out of sight in a few seconds. I was confused at first because nobody else should be in the building with me, but then my heart started beating faster when I came to the realization that the hallway leads to me. I looked at the live feed of the next camera that she would pass through, the one showing the room outside my office. I thought to myself how ridiculous this was, that I am specifically here for this purpose, and I'm too terrified to move. Maybe it's because the woman didn't look usual. Her long hair covered her face. I waited for her to appear in the room, but she didn't. I looked at the feed of the hallway again. Nothing. I looked at every live feed on the monitor and didn't see her anywhere. I picked up my company phone and called my boss. Hey Ben, sorry to wake you. I saw a woman on the monitor in the east hallway. He was confused, of course, and told me to do what I hoped he wouldn't. He told me to find her. I hung up the phone and assured myself that I'm the man, and I am here to kick people out that don't belong, and this is my building. I grabbed my flashlight, which was all I had, and opened the door. The woman was not in the room connected to the office, and after making sure, I opened the door to the east hallway. As soon as the door opened, I saw the woman walking fast towards me at the opposite end of the hall, the way she was walking towards me. I opened my mouth to say something, but something made me stop. The way she was walking. It was threatening. I did not want her to reach me. I closed the door. Shit. No lock. I ran back to my office and closed the door, and thankfully, there was a lock on this one. I looked at the monitor and almost fainted. The woman was standing at the door, right outside the door to my office. How did she get here so fast? She was terrifying. Her hair was so long, 
and she stood at the door facing it like a statue. As I fumbled around the desk grabbing the company phone, I saw her turn around and walk away. My boss told me to find her, and I said I would. I didn't. I didn't leave that office until morning, and I didn't see the woman again. I used to work the overnight shift, often with one other person in my work center. Well, we worked in the basement of a huge complex and would often go outside to smoke, which was a five minute journey upstairs and five minutes back. One night, we decided to take the elevator for a change. Well, approaching the elevator, we see a gentleman in a red polo waiting at the elevator door. When we were about 10 yards away, the door opened and he walked inside. We entered an empty elevator a few steps behind him. Working at Jack in the Box from 2 to 7 in the morning can definitely have its perks. I can go stand in the back where the sinks are and eat food. Sure, I've gained a little weight, but I don't do it as often as I could. The downside is, it can get kinda scary. I'm in there by myself. On a Friday night, about six months ago, I experienced some horror movie shit. This little girl, I'd say about 10 years old, walked up to the drive through window. I wasn't scared when I first saw her. She is just a little girl after all. I opened the window and asked if she was alright. Even though she looked fine, she was wearing tattered clothes that looked very dirty and there was dirt on her face and in her hair. She responded to my question with a question. She asked, Are you alright? I was a bit taken back because of how fast she responded with the same question, and I laughed a little and said, Yeah, what are you doing? She then asked me, What are you doing? I immediately felt very on edge right at that moment. I felt like I was being messed with, and possibly some adults were going to pop out or something and try to rob the place. I looked all around and behind her, but I could only see dark, empty parking lot. I didn't feel like humoring this little girl anymore, so I just closed the window and turned around. I was definitely still creeped out, but I pretended to just go back to work and started wiping down the sides of the fryers. I actually did start to forget about it after I'd say five minutes, when suddenly, I heard tapping on the glass. I turned to look, and she had her face almost pressed against the window. I stood there in utter shock for a second. She stood there, blank-faced, staring at me. I decided to walk over and open the window again. When I did, I asked her, what are you doing here? She didn't respond, but instead took a fork out of her pocket. I closed the window again and she tapped it on the glass. Three of the points on the fork were broken off, leaving just one sharp and incredibly creepy point. I yelled at her that I'm calling the cops so she needs to get the hell out of here. And then she smiled and ran away. I wish I could say the story has a scarier ending, but I'm telling you, it was scary as hell. So random, and I didn't see her again that night, or any other night. My dad used to work nights for the city, spraying weeds and shit. He was spraying pesticides at a graveyard one night, and he said for some reason, he just felt terrified suddenly and looked behind him and like 50 feet away there was this guy sitting on a headstone just giving my dad the 1000 yard stare. Apparently my dad tried to ask him what he was doing out there, told him to leave because of all the chemicals in the air, but the guy just sat there stone still staring my dad in the eye. He took the rest of the night off 
and came home visibly shaken up, and he wasn't the type to let that shit show normally. Not saying it was a ghost or anything, just could have been some weird old man visiting his dead wife or something, but the way he described it was just fucking scary. Good evening everyone. I've come to join Being Scared to help let the darkness take control. I have been babysitting since I was 13. I've had more than a few creepy experiences on the job, but this one was the worst that I've ever had. Last year in April, when I was 17, I had every babysitter's nightmare happen to me. I met the family through my grandmother, Laura. Laura lives in a nicer neighborhood. The people are genuinely nice and everyone knows each other. It was a very small subdivision with a very big highway on one side of it and the woods on the other. One evening, my grandma introduced me to the family that lived across the street who was in need of a babysitter. They were a young couple with their first daughter, Lily. Lily was three years old at the time. After talking to them for a while, the family asked me if I could try babysitting Lily. I agreed. And after watching her a few times, the family asked me to stay on as their regular babysitter. Lily, like most three-year-olds, was a handful, but she was a sweet kid, so I agreed to help the parents out. We set up a schedule where I would come over twice a month regularly for their date nights. This was perfectly fine by me, and as a teen, this was a dream job. Because my grandma lived across the street, we developed a pattern. Every time I babysat, I would park my car at her house and chat to her before I went over to Lily. I would also stop in before I left. My grandma would leave the side door unlocked for me because she would fall asleep sometimes before I got done. A couple of years passed without incident. Lily turned four, then five, and became even more of a handful. The night of the incident, the parents left in the early afternoon, and because the sun was still out, Lily wanted to go to the park down the road. I said no initially, because I had no key to lock the door with, but she wore me down with her persistence. I turned a light on in the living room and led her out of the back door. We stayed at the park until it got dark, and I was exhausted by the time we got back to the house. When we got back, nothing looked out of place. I made Lily stay in the kitchen as I made a sweep around the house to check that everything was okay. The only place that I didn't check was the attic, as I was not allowed to go up there. After confirming to her that there weren't any bogeymen in the house, I cooked dinner for Lily. Afterwards, we played in the basement until it was almost bedtime. As the evening progressed, I would occasionally hear creaks and odd clanking noises from the floor above us, but I just brushed that off as the house being old. The family's cat, a very antisocial creature that hated noise, stood near the top of the steps the whole time that we were in the basement. The cat hissed occasionally at nothing. I consider that to be weirder than anything else. Finally, Declaring it was bedtime, I let Lily climb onto my back and gave her a piggyback ride upstairs. The way her house was laid out, there was a long hallway in the middle. To the left was Lily's room. To the right, directly opposite Lily's room, was the parents' room. The parents' room had a door on the other side, connecting it to the front hall, meaning the front door. Lily was always proud of being a big girl and sleeping in her own room every night. Tonight though, she really missed her parents 
and wanted to sleep in their room. I didn't see this as a problem, it had happened before, and the parents didn't mind. I tucked Lily in, and went back to the kitchen to read until her parents got home. The whole time I was in the kitchen, I kept hearing a strange crunching noise. It would last about a minute before stopping, and then a few minutes later, would start up again, and the cycle would go on and on. I began walking around the house in search of the noise, when I heard Lily starting to cry. Lily normally falls asleep within five minutes, without much incident, so her crying was very unusual. I walked back to her parents' room and stood in the doorway facing her, her back to her room. The only light was a small lamp next to the bed that Lily had turned on. What's wrong, Lily? I asked, stepping closer. Uh, I keep hearing noises. I'm scared. I know, sweetie, but it's okay. I'm looking for them right now. Hey, do you want to come with me? It'll be like an adventure, I said excitedly, trying to cheer her up. I assumed that the noise was the cat playing with something, but I didn't want to leave Lily upset and alone. I figured that if I brought her, I could turn it into a game, which might help her feel better. I walked towards the bed, my back still to the door, and was about to swing her up into my arms to carry her, when she pointed behind me and said, Who's that? I whipped around to see someone big climbing out from underneath Lily's bed. There was something in his hand that glinted in the dim light. He was staring at us. I reached out and slammed the door shut as he lunged through the hallway with a yell. The door had a flimsy lock on it that I clicked into place seconds before the knob started rattling. Lily, understandably, was screaming her head off in panic. Suddenly, the door started shaking as the man began throwing himself at it. I couldn't afford to freeze. The man was at the door leading into the house, praying that he was acting alone and there wouldn't be a partner hiding elsewhere. I snatched Lily into my arms and ran for the other door in the room that led to the front door. The door behind us kept shuddering. I threw open the bedroom door, knowing that I wouldn't have long to undo the two locks on the front door. The shuddering behind us stopped as the man heard us moving. He started screaming at us, running through the inside of the house going the long ways to the front door. I managed to undo the locks and sprinted across the street to my grandma's without looking back. We made it into the house through the unlocked side door, which I quickly locked behind me. Lily was still screaming, which scared my grandma awake. I handed Lily to her and ran through the house checking the locks. Once I was sure that everything was safe, I ran back to my grandma and told her that we needed to call the cops. My grandma gave me her phone. I went into the living room away from all the noise to make the call. On the phone, the operator I spoke to sent police immediately upon hearing what had happened. She then asked me if I could safely see the house. Carefully pulling aside the curtains, I chanced to peek through the window at the house across the street. The front door was shut, which was not how I'd left it, and all of the lights were off, when I always keep at least one light on. I mentioned this to her, and she told me to stay put. The police arrived in a few minutes and did a search of the area, but by that time the man was gone. They spoke to Lily and I, but we couldn't offer much because we didn't get a chance to see him. When the parents got home and saw the chaos, they were terrified and ran over to us. When I told them what happened, they seemed just as confused as we were. Whilst the police didn't find the man, they did find one thing that he left behind under Lily's bed. A box of mint Tic Tacs. The crunching noise that we heard 
was him chewing on them whilst he waited for Lily to go to bed. I don't know who you are or what your plan was to do, but let's never meet again. I grew up in rural Michigan and rode the bus to school every morning. We lived in a house at the bottom of a hill on a country road. My bus stop, however, was at the top of the hill after you passed my house. The story I'm about to tell you happened when I was around 8 years old. I woke up one morning and got ready for school just as I usually did, and my bus picked me up around 7am, right when the sun was starting to come up a little, but there were still spots of darkness deep in the woods. I was the only kid who was picked up from my bus stop, so I would stand at the edge of the woods and wait until the bus came. My mum or dad would have to drop me off five minutes before the bus came and hightail it to work in order to make it there for eight. It's not that they felt completely comfortable doing this, but they didn't have many options. We lived in a safe area, or so we thought, and the bus arrived on time 99% of the time. So they weren't too worried that anything would happen to me in the five minutes I was left alone. So I'm standing there, cold as shit, waiting for the bus to come, watching the sun rise slowly in the sky. It's still a little dark outside, but yet bright enough for me to see what's going on around me. I saw the lights of the bus in the distance on time as usual, and it came to a stop right in front of me. My driver, Mrs. Teresa, opened the door and said good morning, and gestured for me to hop on. I walked to my seat, put my stuff down, but noticed that the bus wasn't moving yet. Mrs. Teresa still had the door ajar, and she just sat there, leaning slightly out of her seat, staring into the woods. After a good minute or so, we were off on our way to school, after picking up a few more kids. Arriving at school, Mrs. Teresa escorted us in, which is something that she never did, and I remember seeing her slip into the office and talking to one of the secretaries. I went through my regular school day, and I was picked up by my dad, as normal. When he picked me up though, he started asking me all kinds of questions. Bus pickup go okay this morning, champ? Did any cars stop or blow the horn at you as you waited? Strange questions that he'd never asked me before. The next morning, my parents did not take me to the bus stop. Mun dropped me off at school before going into work at a later time. This continued alternating as a drop off for my mum or dad for the remainder of the school year. At the same time, I noticed that they changed my bus stop. Years later, I found out why my bus driver went to school that day, and why my bus stop was relocated. When Mrs. Teresa picked me up that morning, she saw a man standing in the woods behind where I was, just staring at me. She alerted the school secretary, who alerted the transportation office for the school district, and then the police. The police investigated and found some items wrapped up in a black t-shirt in the woods. A hunting knife, rope, a rag or washcloth, and tape. The police never found out who the shirt belonged to, but my bus driver, my parents and the police felt certain that whoever it belonged to had the worst of intentions, and probably for me. I think about this often. I wonder what would have happened to me had the bus driver been a few minutes late, or had she not noticed the man standing in the woods after I boarded the bus. Because of this instinct, my school district changed my bus stop to be located right in front of my house. That way, I could stay in my house until the bus pulled up. No more standing by the woods for me. I resume riding the bus to school next year, and creepy bus stop man, Let's not meet, and thanks Mrs. Teresa for most likely saving my life. This story is about my aunt. She was the loveliest woman that you could ever meet, 
and was a big influence in my life when I was growing up. I don't know how all of this started, but out of nowhere one day she just went crazy. Let me give you a bit of background. I am a 6 foot 2 rather fit man. I practice Aikido and can bench press 240. My father and his brothers are pretty much as tall as I am. Maybe less strong due to age though, and most of them have been practicing fighting sports for a long time. My aunt, by contrast, is about 5 foot 2 and probably weighs about 110 pounds at best. She would get incredibly angry and out of control at random times, spitting nonsense words and there would be absolutely no way my father or I or even together would be able to get her down. It felt like Dragon Ball Z Yamcha trying to get Perfect Cell into a UFC submission. She had about 10 times my strength. We needed to be four to actually pin her down and get her to stop moving until she calmed down. This was extremely scary, as she would just switch without warning, which was so out of character for her. I didn't believe in the supernatural, but my grandmother, a traditional Moroccan woman, was convinced that she was possessed. And honestly, it really felt like it. For those of you who don't know, Morocco has a pretty big culture surrounding the supernatural, sorcery, possessions and exorcisms, so most of the elders in the family firmly believe in it. However, at the time, the rest of my family were not buying it. We took her to the hospital and had some extensive tests done on her, because we thought that she must be suffering from some kind of seizures. But everything came back negative. Someone even recommended a psychiatrist and although we took her there, it was of no help whatsoever. We were all becoming very concerned. So fast forward a few months later, and it was becoming way too difficult for us to handle. My uncle contacted a good friend in Morocco, who was an exorcist in his family. He asked us to do one very strange thing. He asked my aunt if she could put a drop of blood into a glass of water and leave the glass somewhere in the apartment while she slept, but just no way near her so that she didn't get up and drink it while she was sleeping. We were reluctant, but my grandmother insisted on her doing it. On the morning, the glass was empty. I personally am still convinced she just woke up and drank it, but in the exorcist version, she was possessed by a demon, commonly known in our culture as a jinn. Giving him blood was just a way for you to welcome him and calm him down temporarily, and she needed to see an exorcist ASAP. Now we were getting convinced that he was right, seeing her often becoming crazier and crazier. In desperate times, sometimes you just choose to believe in a possible solution. So at this point I decided to believe in what he said, and we had to get proof that he was right. We lived in France, and we decided to drive down to Morocco, which was a 1,500 kilometer drive with a 6 hour boat ride, and then another 500 kilometers driving when we got to Morocco. During the drive, I have never been as scared as I am to this day. I was sitting in the back, my auntie in the middle and my dad on the other side. She went crazy at some point. We couldn't hold her down and she was trying to hit my uncle whilst he was driving. We nearly smashed into a wall, and my father had to dangerously choke her until she lost some strength. I know it sounds horrible, but she really was beyond it. So anyway, here we are in Morocco, getting to this village named Seferu, known as one of the biggest places in the country where sorcery happens. It's a rather creepy place, and not in a conventional creepy way either. What we all know of creeps are just what horror movies puts into picture, but the African creepy is on another level. 
we get to meet this exorcist guy, and he asks us to buy a sheep to sacrifice, and tells us that we should bring him the sheep's guts back for the exorcism to happen. My father and uncle take care of this, as I am absolutely petrified. As I stated earlier, I didn't believe in this. I decided to because honestly the situation called for it. But at this point, in a freaky spooky village in the middle of Morocco, we were advised to never eat anything outside or accept anything from a stranger who might try and curse us. Where everything looked twisted as hell. I was losing it. And really could not wait to leave this place forever. On the following day, we went to the exorcist's house and brought him these guts. He put them into a bowl and asked me if we were feeling strong enough to stay, as more people around would make it easier to exorcise. Well, I really wanted to leave, but seeing as everyone was staying, I stayed as well. My aunt was lying down in front of us next to the bowl and we were sitting down around her, holding hands, and the exorcist started saying stuff in a dialect that I couldn't understand. He gets sweaty, and begins speaking faster, and I see my aunt twitching in what looks like pain. And then all of a sudden, all the lights went out. Holy shit, I think I peed my pants at this moment. The exorcist screamed something, and then my aunt screamed as well, and we were in total silence in the dark. I think the silence lasted for about 30 seconds, but honestly, it felt like hours. The exorcist assistant then came in with a lamp, and what we see is that both him and my aunt are passed out. The bowl is on the floor, and the guts are next to it. The guts had turned black. I'm not joking, they were red before the lights went out and then they were black as if they'd been singed beyond belief. I have goosebumps just remembering that and trying to picture it. The assistant urges us not to touch the guts at any cost. The exorcist wakes up and goes to put some water on his face and then tells us to follow him. We went to a nearby empty hill, and when we reached the top, he asked us to burn the guts right then and there, as the demon was now possessing the sheep, and we could get rid of it. And that's exactly what we did. Since that day, my aunt has never shown any problems whatsoever. Her crisis period never happened again. Trying to remember this honestly scares the crap out of me. Just seeing her now gives me the chills, even though she is back to being the loveliest person I know. I am just so glad though, that she is back to the way she was. During my last semester at college, I was assaulted by a football player for walking where he was trying to drive. Note. He was 325 pounds, whilst I was a mere 120. Whilst unconscious on the ground, I lived a different life. I met a wonderful young lady. She made my heart skip and my face red. I pursued her for months and dispatched a few jerk boyfriends before I finally won her over. After a two-year relationship, we got married, and almost immediately she bore me a daughter. I had a great job, and my wife didn't have to work outside the house. When my daughter was two, my wife bore me a son, and my son was the joy of my life. I would walk into his room every morning before I left for work, and doted on him as well as my daughter. One day, though, while sitting on the couch, I noticed that the perspective of the lamp was odd. Inverted, almost. It was still in 3D, just wrong. 
It was a square lamp base, red with gold trim on four legs and a white square shade. I was transfixed. I couldn't look away from it. I stayed up all night staring at it to the point that my wife got very concerned. That's when things started to happen. I didn't go to work. Something. I didn't know what, but something was not right with that lamp. I stopped eating. I only left the couch to use the bathroom at first. Soon, I stopped doing that too, as I wasn't eating nor drinking. I stared at that lamp for three days before my wife became extremely concerned. She had someone come over to try and talk to me. By this time though, my cognizance was breaking up and my wife was freaking out. She took the kids to her mother's house just before I had my epiphany. The lamp was not real. My house was not real. My wife, my kids, none of it was real. The last 10 years of my life had not been real. The lamp started to grow wider and deeper. It was still inverted dimensions. It took up the entire perspective and all I could see was red. I heard voices, screams, all kinds of weird noises. And then I became aware of pain. A shit ton of pain. The first words I said were, I'm missing teeth. I opened my eyes. I was laying on my back on the sidewalk, surrounded by people that I did not know. Lots of them were freaking out and I was completely confused. At some point, a cop scooped me up and walked me across the sidewalk and into the grass and threw me face down into the back of a car. I was still disoriented. I was taken to the hospital by the cop, as it seemed he didn't want to wait for the ambulance driver. I went through about three years of horrid depression. I was grieving at the loss of my wife, my children, and dealing with the knowledge that they never existed. I was scared that I was going insane, and I would cry myself to sleep, hoping I would see her in my dreams, that I would blink, and I would wake up again in the reality that I once knew. I never have. But sometimes I see my son, usually just a glimpse out of my peripheral vision. He is perpetually five years old, and I can never hear what he says. I have no idea what happened. Could I have dreamt it all? Could you dream ten years of a whole life? A person, moments shared, places gone, new experiences, new tastes, new smells. Can it all come from your mind? Really? I don't think so. But like I said, I have no explanation for what happened that day. And it still leaves me speechless. There was some construction being done at a new building at my university. So one day, my buddy and I meet some nice girls at the bar and as the evening gets late, they ask to smoke a joint with us. For whatever reason, we decide the new construction site is a great location for this, and we go to it. 15 minutes in, and my buddy lets me know that there are cops watching us and that it's time to dip. We start to casually walk away, when the girls decide to book it immediately drawing sirens. My friend taps me on the shoulder and reminds me that chivalry is dead. Those girls are on their own, and he has a spot to hide. He takes me to a half-constructed elevator shaft for the new building, and we climb all the way down to the bottom, where we find an underground, massive network of tunnels. When I say massive, I mean multiple channels each, which are multiple kilometers long. At this point we're pretty drunk, and we decide to see how far this thing goes. Every 500 meters or so, there would be a wooden barrier, 
but a few quick flying body checks made short work of them, and we continued on our way. Eventually we found a ladder and a hatch, and decided that we'd come too far to not see what's up there. So we climb and go through and find ourselves in a locked room in the middle of our university library. About a kilometre and a bit from where we started. A janitor walks in and catches us clearly doing something we weren't supposed to be doing. But I pulled my best Seymour Skinner impression and said that we were just trying to find how to get out of there. Thankfully, he bought it. All was too confused to figure out how we got into the locked room in the first place and decided to let us leave without any further questions. We didn't find anything too exciting in the tunnels. A few empty beer bottles and that's about it. But I made it home without a possession and or trespassing charge. So I will call it a win. I attended a family reunion recently and saw a distant cousin of mine who was in his early to mid twenties. And he told me a story about an experience that he had during his third year of high school. Let's call my cousin Francis. Francis was about five foot four and thin for a 17 year old at the time. He was also very prone to injuries, especially broken bones. Apparently during his third year of high school, the school he attended just hired more janitors. And according to my cousin, all of them were okay, except this particular one. The janitor was in his mid fifties, clean hair and teeth. But according to my cousin, there was something off about him. The guy would always carry a cross or some sage with him whenever he cleaned up classrooms and would tell the student things like, God bless you. He would always mumble biblical quotes underneath his breath. At first, a lot of the students didn't mind him. Francis said that many respected him, even though he did these things. One day, however, everything changed. My cousin and his three friends stayed behind after school one day to finish up a big project. The room was unlocked, but the teacher in charge left. But before she did, she told them to have that specific janitor lock the door for them when they were done. So my cousin and his friends continued their group project until at one point the janitor came in. What my cousin remembered, he said, was that the janitor was in prayer pose and had his eyes closed. When he finished that, he watched them as they were working. And after about 10 to 15 minutes of staring at them, he offered to lead a religious sermon. My cousin said no, because they had a project to finish. Apparently he didn't hear the no and decided to begin his sermon by saying that Francis and all of his friends were going to hell because they did not want to hear the word of God. The group was already frustrated because the project was worth 25% of their grade. So they politely told him to leave. The janitor, of course, became enraged and just lost it. He ran towards my cousin and punched him in the face, knocking him down onto the ground. Apparently the janitor was strong as hell as well and placed all of his weight on top of Francis. His friends were trying to pry the janitor off him because he had his hands around Francis's throat. As he's choking the life out of my cousin, he's yelling, you devil, you will burn in hell for eternity. Francis was wheezing and basically borderline unconscious, causing panic for his friends. But I guess someone heard him because another janitor came in, a female, and then got a broom and beat him with it until they managed to push him off my cousin. The janitor gets pushed off and gives Francis enough time to be pulled away by his friends and carried off into the hallway. The female janitor calls for backup and long story short, the principal gets the police and the paramedics. 
The janitor was screaming religious stuff as he was being carried out by the officers. It turned out that the janitor dislocated my cousin's shoulder and seriously bruised his neck and ribs. Francis stayed in the hospital for a number of days. The whole experience gave him trauma and he had to go to therapy for a few months. So in the end, the female janitor was awarded for saving my cousin. And also, the janitor was going to serve 15 years for this and past crimes. Francis still stayed at the school and eventually graduated, still living around the same area, but he promises to never return to that school. <laughs>